we were sent homework with three questions. So that's what my talk is going to try and do, is address the three questions that were posed by Anthony in terms of what are the questions that we should be asking, what methods should we be using, and how do we train PhD students to tackle these questions and use these methods. So that's going to be the underlying topic of my presentation. I will be using different examples and drawing from those examples the questions and the methods. Um, so I want to start by revisiting those three questions and as we do this, remembering the notion of interdisciplinary. We talk about translation and interpreting being interdisciplinary endeavors and I want to see exactly what does it mean. When we say interdisciplinary, how far are we going to go? How, how out of our um, circle do we get in order to look for methods, in order to look for theoretical frameworks that would sustain what we are wanting to do? And um, interaction with scholars from other disciplines that are definitely enriching what we are doing. So here are the three questions that we were asked to address, right? And we can do that, that from, from here. Um, starting with some of the new trends in interpreting research, and I'm going to be um, piggybacking on what Franz has already been saying and Miriam has already been saying, and I will go back to the notion of opening a closed circle, and by this I will be mostly referring to the situation of interpreting studies in the United States, and I will be talking about a closed circle that's very easy to pinpoint there, and you can transfer if that is also the situation in other countries, and if, and if it's not, we can share uh, afterwards, you know, how other countries managed to open up that circle earlier or are still uh, maybe in the circle or not conceiving that it's a third circle and looking at theories and methods from related fields. In other words, what fields are making the notion of um, oral interaction among uh, speakers of different languages possible and what kind of frameworks can we take to look at that, what kind of um, methods are allowing us to look at the different issues, and looking at interpreting not just from the psycholinguistic uh, side, which has been done. We have research from Jill dating back to more than 20 years, so we, we, we know um, some about the cognitive aspect, the information processing aspect of interpreting, and we are asking how can we make that research enter into a dialogue with, for example, the social aspect of interpreting, which is something that I have been trying to do, but uh, it's sometimes it's, it's not enough to look at it in one setting, as we have discussed, what happens when we throw in more variables that have to do with uh, uh, interact, interlocutors not standing in equal footage, like what happens in the course or what happens in hospitals or in communities. Looking at interpreting as a situated practice. In other words, we, look, we, um, we have research that answers questions about what happens in the minds of interpreters, how they approach the process, and now we are asking and when we have a context, when we have an institution that's framing that interaction, how do we ask questions? What kind of questions do we ask and how do we get them answered? So the notion of interpreting as a situated practice is going to be um, prevalent in this talk. And then what are the pedagogies and what are the testing uh, instruments that we can be using to measure the effectiveness of the interpreter in that situation? And um, underlying all of this is the notion of interdisciplinary work that I want to revisit. So if we start with something that we have already seen too many times, my question here is not to revisit the model that we know has been pervasive, even if we say we are no longer constrained by the notion of the interpreter being a conduit or invisible, I would argue that the profession is in some ways. But what I want to do here is look at how did this come into being? How was it possible to understand or to conceptualize communication as something where it's linear, there's no negotiation in meaning, be it monologic or dialogic. It's just the notion that the interpreter can just be doing something that a machine could be doing. How did we come to do this? Well, I would argue that it, it, it was possible because maybe we were not looking at it from different angles and we were conceptualizing this as at the level of the word, at the level of the phrases, at the level of units of meanings, however we want to call it, it was just looking at one very limited aspect and with little influence from other disciplines that was causing what um, I'm calling this closed circle. And I don't know how, how 
this is easy or not for you to read, but basically what I want to do here is think in the context of interpreting in the United States, it is not uncommon to see professional associations being run by practitioners. And so practitioners generate discourse. Uh, practitioners do have a say in, as they should, in code of ethics and standards of practice. Um, practitioners sometimes teach in schools, and therefore the discourse of practitioners um, influencing the ethics in the profession, the norms of the profession, the ways in which uh, this knowledge gets passed on to students and whatnot, creates um, a, a circle that is producing the professional discourse in interpreting. When that professional discourse is not being influenced by theories and research that are extremely relevant, I would argue, such as bilingualism, uh, sociolinguistics, because after all we are talking about oral interaction, uh, social theory that is helping us to frame that interaction in an institution that is in itself constrained by society, um, notions of linguistic anthropology, of responsibility um, in talk, uh, on how talk differs if we have a witness in that talk or if it's just uh, two interlocutors, what's the impact of a third person in a conversation. Um, if research and theories from translation studies that are helping us to look at uh, text and look at the construction of meaning in text or look at text in isolation, uh, if, if those fields do not enter into a serious dialogue, and that is inter interdisciplinary work, then we run the risk of thinking, well, interpreting studies is so different that we need to look at it a different way. Or, and, and I think that is, on the one hand, yes, it's true. We have a lot of things that only pertain to an interpreted situation, an interpreted communicative event, that are not necessarily true uh, when we look at the interaction of a translator and a text or a reader and a text, but there's a lot that is in common. But most importantly, there's a lot in here that is of interest to uh, disciplines that can only help us expand the way in which we look at the problem that we have at hand. So as we continue during this talk and our discussion, I hope we revisit this notion of um, if we are an interdisciplinary endeavor, this circle cannot stay as it is. And therefore, uh, from our methods to our theories to our impacts, we will be seeing different consequences. So, of course, in the 90s, we saw the, the conduit model really not holding up anymore because of many of the research that we um, saw coming from sociolinguistics and looking at this um, event as interaction. Interaction in the sense that the interpreter gets not only address during the talk when parties turn to interpret and say, please tell the doctor that blah, 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 right? That's in a medical setting. The same thing can happen in any setting when you're, when you're looking at conference and you're looking at uh, negotiations and you're having consecutive interpreting. There is clarification going on. The interpreter is being addressed as a participant. The interpreter brings the self to interaction in any kind of, of interaction, I would argue. What we do with that self varies, but we, all interpreters have agency. Um, so the interaction is modeled with heavy influence from sociolinguistics, um, helped us see the interpreter as a co-participant, as somebody who gets addressed in talk. And so that changed the whole way of looking at interpreting. And then, further on, work that framed that interaction. We already established that the interpreter is a co-participant. But now we look at where that interaction is happening, uh, in a particular setting, as I said, a situated practice in a court of law, in a hospital, in a school, in a business negotiation. What happens to those participants when they are part of an institution? What rules do they follow in that conversation? How does the institution um, generate norms, cultural norms, uh, that, that have to be adopted by the parties? How does the institution constrain that interaction? and how that institution, which is part of a society that also comes with cultural norms and societal blueprints and whatnot, is also constraining the interaction. Therefore, social factors that would affect any type of communication, oral, any type of monolingual communication, get reenacted in an interpreted communicative event simply because all participants are bringing to the interaction the self with, with the agency that you know, we have all learned from sociological studies, social theory, that 
there is no such thing as neutrality in the talk, that we cannot separate language from power, and this gets enacted in this kinds of interactions. So it's not unusual to see how affect, how notions of solidarity or gender or um, power uh, get enacted during that interaction and what all the parties are doing with that. In that sense, the interpreter bringing the agency to the uh, interaction, the self to the interaction, is definitely not going to be seen as a neutral party. It's, I, I'm calling that a visible agent, and this by no means is uh, Venuti's terminology of invisibility being in the shadow of the translator. This is really talking about the agency of the interpreter and taking part and deciding what to do and how to manipulate all these uh, issues of, of power that the interpreter has to deal with. So in this context and within this model is that we are bringing uh, frameworks that are allowing us to see the complexity of this kind of interaction and not really reducing it to uh, just the, the interpreter and what happens wh when the interpreter can or cannot handle certain linguistic challenges. And as I said before, we have a lot of research from psycholinguistics that, that allows us to see how the interpreter approaches within the interpreter's mind, what the interpreter does with that information in the information processing aspect. Now we worry about, or we should worry about, entering into dialogue with that kind of research and now having the social aspect in place and going, can certain things be sustained in this model or not? So when we break uh, that closed circle, what we see is that the research that has been produced out of sociolinguistics has been for just sociolinguistics to cite one example, but right from different angles, has been embracing relevant theories and research from related fields. And so that the conceptual frameworks or social frameworks that we've been constructed to try and tackle these problems of the agency of the interpreter, the role of the interpreter, the interpreter in a situated practice are coming from other fields than interpreting studies. And that should not be seen as a failure of interpreting studies or a weakness. It's simply human interaction and we look for frameworks that frame the problem we want to tackle in the best way. It has also been possible because there has been collaboration across different disciplines. Uh, when we look at, for example, the medical interpreting, we look at communication in a medical setting, we look at the interaction of interpreting research and communication in a medical setting in a monolingual mode, and we look at issues of power and solidarity, and we bring all that research to bear to look at specifically the role of the interpret in a medical uh, uh, interpreted event. Um, I think it's also possible that we break into that closed circle because we are challenging findings. We are not happy with some of the things that have been established because they simply cannot be sustained in a different setting. So by challenging findings, we are pushing the field, we are opening the circle. We are putting theories to test by doing this kind of uh, interactive work. And I, and I purposely put new theories, not just new theories. When the th uh, theory of um, la théorie du sens was influencing the field for so long, we were maybe at the point, I remember um, uh, your work, Daniel, being so influential in challenging the theory and putting it to work and seeing what can we learn from it. And it's hard when we think on the first part, meaning gets constructed all the time, even in a monolingual mode. So, so that, that's okay, but then what do we do with that? And yes, interpreting is not about words, as translation is not about words, that's an established fact because there's more to, to, to words and to worry about. But how do we know and what else do we do with it? And so the notion of, of putting not just new theories to work, but to the test, but old theories too. And most importantly, I think we break uh, away from that closed circle by replacing opinions and anecdotes by a culture of evidence. And by this I mean not just empirical, theoretical research that will allow us to move away from th these are things we think versus these are things that are observable, that systematically we can observe, that are really helping us see um, results that would allow us to put some claims forward. The notion of uh, translating uh, research into practice. So we get out of that circle by also looking at our findings and how our findings are or are not impacting practice. The so what question, how can we 
bring to bearing the findings into the, the realities of interpreters at work and expanding research and theory in translation and interpreting studies. And if you look at, I'm, I'm not trying here to do one, two, three, four, and they should be done in the same way, but it's starting all over again. It's like, okay, we produce some research, we have a finding, we challenge it, we push it, and we question it, and we start over again. And this is a, a, um, something that I think we need to keep doing. So let's look at some possible theoretical frameworks that have been used in the field of interpreting studies when we look at situated practice. So we are familiar with cognitive psychology. We have used frameworks in, from communication, cultural studies, education, feminist theory, linguistic, psycholinguistic, sociolinguistic, social theory, and within sociology, all of these different theories in sociology have been used to argue uh, for the fact that, for example, uh, interpreting is an interaction and these um, sociological aspects are affecting the way in which the interpreter is interacting with the parties and the parties with the interpreter. These theoretical frameworks are allowing us to look at the interpreted event in a broader way and those frameworks are available to us in interpreting studies. So it's about uh, building bridges and, and, and conducting interdisciplinary work. We have a problem, what is the framework that's going to frame that problem better and we borrow from there. So just to give an example of my own work, if I'm worried about the role of the interpreter, the agency of interpreter in a particular setting as the medical one, I borrow from the lens of social theory um, something that will allow me to look at the interpreter communicative event at the level of the institution and society and look at how the institution and the society are affecting the interaction during that event. I borrow from sociological theories and I look at the interpreter communicative event at the level of interpersonal relations of how the parties are aligning with each other or are converging, diverging on the basis of social factors and I also use the lens of linguistic anthropology and I look at responsibility at talk. Uh, I, I look at the interpreted communicative event now not framed by an institution and society, not two parties interacting, but just looking at the discourse and looking at how the discourse gets changed because of the presence of a witness. And there's wonderful research from um, linguistic anthropology. Let me give an example of a Samoan village when um, a couple was celebrating their wedding anniversary and hired um, uh, somebody to come and sing for them and they didn't pay that singer well. So the singer got insulted and thought that the only way they could, he could get back to the couple was by overpraising them during the song. So uh, he starts singing to the couple and going, you queen and king of this village. And that overpraising only became an insult to the couple because witnesses were there. Neighbors from the village that knew that these people were not the king and queen uh, made 